Next, let's take a look at the dispersion of light. You've probably all seen pictures like this before of white light going into a prism and being split into the separate colors. Why does this happen? It has to do with the fact that light travels at different speeds proportional to its wavelength. So if we look at this graph right here, we can see index of refraction, which is how fast the light travels. The bigger that number is, the slower light goes, um, as proportional to the wavelength. So we can see certain colors, like we look for crown glass, for example, that the blue or violet or colors move slower than uh, the redder ones, that they have a higher index of refraction. They're going to be slowed more or they're going to bend more. So in general, for most materials, the blue or more violet colors will refract more than the red ones will. And this can create the spreading of the color spectrum, which is known as dispersion. Okay, so we have the dispersion of light. Um, dispersion to disperse means to spread out. The spreading out of light. And this has to do with the speeds of the waves. Now, when you're in a vacuum, so this is particular for a vacuum, the speed of light in the vacuum is the same for all wavelengths of light. And so that's the little c. c is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's true for every wavelength. However, when you are in a medium instead, we find that different wavelengths, which would correspond to different colors, travel at different speeds. This is only true when you're in a medium. So therefore, the index of refraction is dependent upon lambda, the wavelength. Uh, for most materials, the longer wavelengths slow the least. So those longer wavelengths, which would be like redder colors, are going to slow down the least and therefore bend the least. So red will bend the least. So we see this white light, which is comprised of all the colors coming into the prism, refracting, refracts here, and it also refracts there. So two refractions, and in both places, the red just bends a little bit, but the blue and violet bend a lot more and end up in different places. And so if we were to come up with sort of a spectrum of uh, slowing slash bending of light, and on this end, we've got the most slowing and bending. And on this end, we have the least slowing and bending. The uh, most slowing and bending would happen for violet. And of course, the ultraviolet's even more so. The least for red or below that infrared. And so then green somewhere in between. So some middle amount of bending. Another example of this would be the behavior of a diamond. We already talked about how diamonds can totally internally reflect. So the white light goes in and comes out. But as the light refracts through the diamond, through the angled edges of the diamond, um, it bends by different amounts. And so the reds and the blues and the greens separate. As you can see in the picture below, we get some color or fire to the diamond. Um, as well as light bouncing around and passing out, we get gleams of different colors. We can also use this idea of dispersion to understand how rainbows are formed. So we see the person in this picture down here below um, observing that this rainbow above them, the spreading of the colors, being created by the water droplets that are in the atmosphere above. Now the sun is behind the photographer in this picture, and you can tell that by the fact you can see his uh, uh, shadow down here at the bottom. And when sunlight, this white sunlight, which is comprised of all the colors, shines and it hits one droplet of water, we get some bending. And notice the red just bends a little bit, but the violet bends a lot. And it bounces off the back of the water droplet. Now, of course, some passes out, but some is going to reflect and then it's going to bend a second time. And again, the violets bend a lot and the red just a little bit. So we end up with a spreading and we get reds down here on the bottom, greens in the middle, and blues and violets on the top. Now wait a minute, you might be wondering, that seems backward from this picture. Here the red is on the top of the rainbow, but here it seems to be on the bottom of the water droplet. Why is that? We can best understand this because when we see a rainbow, we're not looking at one water droplet creating and spreading out the colors. We're looking at lots of water droplets. And we look at water droplets that are above us, we're seeing the waves that bend the least, the red that come down here. The ones that bend a lot, like the blues, go right over our head. The violets go right over our head. So we see red in this water droplet. Somewhere a water droplet that's in the middle will see green, and a water droplet on the bottom will see purple or violet. So we should see red at the top of the rainbow and violet at the bottom. What's kind of funny is this graphic is correct, but the picture in the background is actually drawn backwards. <laughs> If we look, go back to our original picture, we can see indeed that the red is on the top and the, the violet on the bottom. So let's add a picture to our notes of the creation of a rainbow. And so we can see red just bending a little bit 
and the blue or the violet bending a lot and spreading them out. So here come three rays of sun hitting the, the different droplets of water. And the one up here um, just bends a little bit, comes down to the ground. Um, this one down here is going to bend a lot and is going to come down to the ground. And I don't have a green pen. This one's going to bend somewhere in between. And so this droplet is going to appear red when I view it. This one green. And this one blue. When viewed by my eye, I will see the rainbow. Finally, we're going to consider something called the polarization of light. This has to do with the way that these light uh, waves are set up, um, caused by random motion of molecules. Um, the plane of the transverse wave can vary. There's lots of different planes that are all present at the same time and typical light, unpolarized light. If we have one single plane in which the light wave exists, we say that this light is polarized. So I know these pictures might be helpful as well. We've got um, this flashlight right here, which has um, you know, a hot light bulb filament or an LED, and there are waves that are, some are oscillating vertically and some side to side and some at angles. So this is unpolarized light. It's oscillating in all different directions. But if we filter it, so we only allow oscillations in one direction, we now have polarized light. Again, kind of a picture of all these random waves and then switching to polarized. So let's fill our notes in for this. Uh, last heading is the polarization of light. Light can be polarized. So I said before, most uh, light's created by charges that are oscillating randomly. So you have a hot piece of metal and some of the charges will be oscillating side to side and some up and down, some left and right. So this could be the sun, a hot light bulb filament or ionized gas, it's all random. Um, and these waves exist in many different planes of oscillation all at the same time. Uh, this kind of naturally occurring light is called un, unpolarized. This and most light tends to be unpolarized naturally since it's created by random vibrations. So again, we can kind of represent that by drawing these arrows showing that the oscillations are in all different directions. We get all these different waves in all different directions. But if we go through a special uh, device we'll talk about in a moment called a filter, um, after going through the filter, um, we can end up with just polarized light. So we have unpolarized here and polarized here. If we have light waves that oscillate in one plane, they are said to be completely polarized. And polarized light. This could be achieved by running unpolarized light through a filter, um, which only allows waves oscillating in one plane or the plane of something called the transmission axis. And you don't necessarily need to know that term for the test or anything, but the transmission axis is part of the filter, what the filter allows through. And uh, so this particular filter seems to have a transmission axis that would look like this. I know it's the opposite of those lines there, but this would be its transmission axis. Transmission axis. It's only allowing oscillations in that direction to pass through. Now this is a 3D drawing. If I tried to draw the same thing in two dimensions, uh, it would probably look something like this. Now as you see this ray of light travel through the filter, we have our source and our source is unpolarized, then I could show that it's oscillating in many different directions by drawing things like this. Goes through the filter. My transmission axis, call that TA. And then waves will pass through that are polarized and they will only be oscillating in this direction. Um, the light should be dimmer on the other side because we filtered out all the things that are oscillating side to side. We've only allowed half the light to pass through the parts that are oscillating in that direction. So a filter is one way to get polarized light. Another way to get polarized light is with a good laser. Uh, lasers, by the way that the light is created, tend to create oscillations only in one direction. All of the oscillations look the same. So laser light is naturally polarized. Other places where we might find polarized light um, in nature, I guess, um, not man-made, um, is whenever we see reflected or refracted light. So 
the light that bounces off of a surface or light that bends as it goes through a surface tends to get polarized somewhat. So we have light, unpolarized light striking glass. Um, the reflected light will be polarized in one direction and the refracted light in another. And this is highly angle dependent, so at certain angles this effect can be more dramatic. Another case in nature where we might find polarized light naturally is in what's called scattered light. Now, scattered light is when light has been absorbed by a molecule, say of air, and then re-emitted. So the molecule takes in that energy of the photon for a moment, it bumps an electron up a level, and then it drops back down and re-emits the light. And again, this is most noticeable at certain angles. So this picture, I think, illustrates that pretty well. So this could be like sunlight traveling through the atmosphere. The sunlight travels through the atmosphere, it hits a molecule in the air, say a nitrogen, N2 molecule, absorbed, that photon gets absorbed, and then it gets re-emitted, and ones that get re-emitted forward tend to still be unpolarized, um, but ones that get emitted downward um, below might have a polarized nature to them, and so you can tell a difference when you look at those two lights. Uh, it will be dimmer in this direction, um, and their, a polarizing filter could also cancel this light out. So if you look straight above you at the blue sky as the sunlight shines through it, and this is your sunglasses lens, if you were to uh, set up your transmission axis like this, perpendicular to the way that the light's actually polarized, so transmission axis, um, you wouldn't see anything. No light would come through. It would all get filtered out, and uh, you would think, you look up here, you'd say, wow, this is dark um, at that spot up there. Um, whereas this fellow um, up here at the top, if he had sunglasses on and he's looking, <laughs> kind of looking at the sun, I guess, um, and if he had, it doesn't really matter which way his transmission axis is, uh, that's going to filter out some of the light, but not all of it. And so the light passes through and he'll get some of the light that's going in this direction. And so uh, his sunglasses are still effective, but they just it just looks dimmer rather than completely canceled out um, because the light was unpolarized to begin with. And you can kind of see that in this uh, illustration right here. Um, we have unpolarized light coming from the sun, um, some of it getting filtered out. Um, but polarized light, either from scattering or in this case reflection, sun bounces off the water or the road, um, and driving and boating polarized uh, sunglasses can be really helpful. Um, and so polarizing filters, you'll find them on sunglasses. Um, and uh, cameras is another place where you might uh, want to have a polarizing filter to cancel out glare as light bounces off of surfaces. And uh, if the light's already polarized, you can cancel out the polarized part, the bouncing part. Um, and uh, this picture down here below sort of illustrates what's happening with the way the filter works. Is it's going to be analogous to a slit uh, that a rope a transverse wave is passing through. Um, in this orientation, the rope wave can pass through, but if I were to turn it sideways, it would cancel out the wave. So you might wonder how a polarizing filter works. Uh, basically, we have long strings of molecules. And uh, based on the orientation of the molecules, the light can be canceled out or not. Um, these are conductive molecules. So the, remember this electromagnetic wave oscillating up and down. So if you try to send it through this way, um, it will send electrons moving up and down these chains and it will soak up all the energy of that light wave and nothing passes through. But if the light is turned like this, it can't create movement along the chains and so the light passes right through. So in this case, the transmission axis would be uh, vertical transmission axis in these pictures, so it cancels out this light but not the other. If uh, we have a wave pass through at an angle, so again if we have a vertical transmission axis and it comes through at a slant like this, only a component of the light wave, the piece that's in that direction, will pass through, so it will make the light appear dimmer. Here's an example of uh, photography uh, using a polarizing lens. You put it over the end of your camera and it makes a little less light come into your camera, but notice how uh, it's able to cancel out the glare from the front of the store window because the glare is polarized from reflection. So that we just turn the camera lens or we turn the polarizing filter until it cancels out. Its transmission axis lines up to cancel it out and we can see what's going on inside the store. Um, here's an example of looking at the water surface with polarized glasses, and you can see how all of this glare on the water, this reflected glare, a lot of it's being canceled out, um, but it is somewhat angle dependent. So we get good canceling happening right here, but we still get a little bit of glare at this angle over here. Uh, but polarizing glasses can be really useful for lots of reasons.